Hi, families. We're going to have a little bit of a different learning session this month. For February, we thought it would be really nice for us to look around our church and get to be familiar with some of the things we see at Mass. We have so many things in our homes that have certain places that they belong or certain uses that we use for them. Um, and today, we thought it would be nice for me and some others that familiar faces that you should know to walk us through some of the things we'll see at Mass or while we're here at church. So let's take a look around our church. Hello, everybody. Where I'm standing right now is what we call the sanctuary. And in the church, the sanctuary is everything that's on the steps and at the top of the steps. So it's from all the way over here, where Deacon Bob is standing by the ambo, which you'll hear about in a minute, and all the way over here to these chairs over here before the music section. The word sanctuary comes from the word sanctum, which means holy. It means something that is set apart for a holy purpose. So it's different from everyday life, even though some of the things we'll find are, not, are similar to things we have in everyday life. So very importantly, the main thing first is we have the altar. And the altar is a place that has two functions. One is it's a place of sacrifice. And we hear it in the Old Testament that animals and other things were sacrificed to God. But with Jesus Christ, he becomes the one and only sacrifice, the only sacrifice we make. So the altar is where we celebrate that sacrifice, which is Jesus' death and resurrection in order to save us. But the altar also is a table, just like you have a table at home. And what Jesus gives us in his death and resurrection at the Last Supper, remember he said, take and eat, take and drink. And that's the communion we receive when we come to communion. So in that sense, the altar is also a table for eating because God gives us his body and blood and says, eat this bread and drink this cup. On the altar, of course, there's lots of prayers. And so for the priests and the deacons and the others, we have this book which is called the Roman Missal. And it's got lots of bookmarks, lots of ribbons, like in other books you have to mark your place because there's many special prayers through the Mass. And so we have them all right here, very handy in this book. And of course, during Mass, we see a lot of things. So when we get to the, um, the part of the Mass where we consecrate the body and blood into, uh, in, we consecrate the bread and wine to become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we take the things we need from this little table, which we call the credence table. So the first thing we take is a corporal. And a corporal comes from the word body. And so we open that, and the reason we have it is, uh, I'm gonna hold it up, but those of your altar servers never pick up the corporal because it's supposed to capture any crumbs that fall from the body or blood of Christ. But I'm holding it up because there's a cross in the middle. And traditionally, in the altar, and I don't know if we have one, there's a relic of a saint. And so the cross marks the spot over which there's a relic of a saint. And we'll talk about relics another day. So we put the corporal here, because it will uh, capture pieces of the body of Christ, that is, crumbs from the consecrated bread or drops from the consecrated wine. And so then we put here a uh, purificator, which is like a napkin, and it has that purpose, that particularly when we consume the blood of Christ, we can wipe our mouth with it, but we also use it to purify, that is, to clean the, um, uh, the, the, the vessels we use afterwards. And so the next thing then we'll have, this is called a patent. And uh, the patent, I'll hold it here so you can see it, but there'll be a host, an unconsecrated bread. And uh, so it's, it's just bread when we put it here. But then with the prayers that we say, that the church gives us, and repeating the words that Jesus gave us, that bread becomes the body of Christ, which then we consume in communion. We also will either bring from the tabernacle, which we'll hear about in a minute, um, or uh, when we have a lot of people, we'll have an extra supply of bread we call hosts. And so we put them here in what's called the ciborium. And it's just another vessel to hold additional hosts, and sometimes we'll take them from the tabernacle. So once the bread is here on the altar, then we say a prayer to bless it, and then we move uh, to the wine. And so when there's a deacon, the deacon will pray, prepare the chalice, and the chalice is a special cup and uh, it's meant to hold the wine we use that becomes the body of Christ. And so the deacon will pour into the chalice some wine and then one drop of water. And uh, that reminds us of the blood and the water that came from the side of Jesus Christ uh, on the cross. What else do we have? Patent, I think I hit everything. Purificator, the corporal, ciborium, patent, chalice. Oh, 
when I left out one thing. An important thing here is it sometimes might just seem like furniture, but we have some chairs. And the presider's chair, it's called the presider's chair, is a little bit like a throne. You know, if you see a movie that has kings and queens in it, when the king or queen speaks from the throne or at the throne, it's a symbol of their authority that I'm not just speaking like, you know, just some regular guy or some regular woman, but I speak because I have given this particular authority. So the priest, when he says prayers from this chair, is not just speaking as I'm just a guy, which I am, but when I'm here, I'm speaking with the authority of a priest given through Jesus Christ. And um, likewise, we'll hear a minute in a minute about the ambo, the place where we hear the readings. When we're at the ambo, that's the time, it's a place of authority also, because anything spoken from the ambo is spoken with the authority uh, of the church. So the person there is not speaking on his own or her own, but saying something sacred from the church. All right, Deacon Bob. So while we have the liturgy of the Eucharist at the altar, we also have a special place for the readings of the Mass. And that place is called the Ambo, which I am at. And at the Ambo, the first part of the readings would be from the lectionary. The lectionary was kind of hard to see, so here's a closer look. This is the cover of the Year B lectionary. Why Year B? Because we are in Year B this year. Mrs. Rome talks about this all the time. There are actually three lectionary books, one for Year A, one for Year B, one for Year C. When we open the cover, you see here that it does say Year B. All of the Sunday readings for Year B are in this book. Okay, back to Deacon Bob. After that, I would go to the altar, reverence the altar, pick up the book of the Gospels and bring it back to the ambo and do the reading for that week. Again, in the camera, it was kind of hard to see, but this is the cover of the Book of the Gospels. What many people don't know is that the Book of the Gospels has the same exact front cover and back cover. So when you put it down on the altar and you pick it up from the altar, you're always looking at the same image. When you open it up, you notice it says the Book of the Gospels, but it doesn't say the year. That's because the Book of the Gospels has all three years, years A, B, and C in the book. Okay, back to Deacon Bob. So now when we start Mass, we usually come in with a processional cross, which is behind the tabernacle. Tabernacle holds the living body and blood of Christ. Well, I don't have a key to show you what's inside. There would be a container with the consecrated hosts and also a small pix for people who have gluten intolerance. So that's a special host for them as well. So when you go into a church and you want to find out where the tabernacle is, you would look for the sanctuary candle, which is right here. No matter what church you go into, you're looking for this candle and you know where the tabernacle is. Uh, processional cross, which Maura is showing you. So some of you may be altar service. We're not doing procession now, maybe just from the door for altar service, but that we would process around the church. The altar server would come to the front and put the cross back on its stand behind the tabernacle. And then the altar server would go to their chair. So now I'm standing near the baptismal font, but very often uh, when you come into church, of course, the first thing we would often do is to bless ourselves with holy water. And on the insides right near the doors, we have holy water fonts. Now right now, we have them covered up because of the pandemic, but we bless ourselves with that holy water because it comes from the baptismal font. And the baptismal font is where we baptize babies. So many of you have probably been to one or more baptisms here, uh, you probably don't remember your own if you're children, but you, maybe you were here for the baptism of a younger brother or a younger sister or a cousin or something like that. And so the baptismal font is filled with water, and with that water then, 
uh, the child is baptized, becomes a member of the body of Christ, the most important moment in any of our lives. And um, we also sometimes baptize, not baptize, I'm sorry, sometimes we bless the congregation. Sometimes we walk around the church and with this, um, basically a bucket for what we call the spurges. And asperges is when we put the holy water onto uh, the people. And we usually do that all during the Easter season, after Easter, to remind us of our baptism, to remember the great gift to be incorporated into the body of Christ through baptism. So right near uh, the baptismal font, normally we keep the, what's called the Paschal candle. And Paschal refers to Easter. And so every year at the Easter vigil, the night before Easter Sunday, as when we uh, commemorate the resurrection of Jesus and a mass of great joy, and then we light this candle for the first time. And it's a new candle that's lit that day, and we use it all the way through the following year. And on it, it has a number of things, but it includes the year uh, in which we're celebrating and the notation that, we, that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And the idea is that Jesus is everything. He's the beginning and the end. And Alpha and Omega are letters in the Greek alphabet. Alpha is like the letter A in our alphabet, and Omega is like the letter Z. It's the last letter, so the idea is it includes everything. So we light the candle. We always light the candle again at every baptism, and we also light the candle when we have a funeral for someone who dies, and we put a large white cloth over the casket because it's a symbol of a baptismal garment, the garment that they received at their baptism. So all the moments of our life in Christ are connected through the baptismal water and through the paschal candle. And then we also have here uh, what's called the thurible. And in the thurible, um, we put incense. And we use incense in a number of ways. So you may remember at Christmas time when we heard about the three kings, they brought three gifts to Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And the second one, frankincense, is incense. And so an incense is uh, considered an offering to God. There's a, in the Old Testament, we say our prayers rise like incense, and you see the smoke of the incense go up. So the incense is in this little, uh, little bowl, and every time you want to use it, there's burning coals in here in what's called the thurible, and we put the incense on the coals, and then they smoke. The smoke rises up, and then either the priest or the deacon takes the thurible and uses it to pray and offer praise in some particular way. So during the Mass, if we're having incense during the Mass, at the very beginning, we would, I think I'll just do it. At the very beginning of Mass, the priest will come, and a server in the procession will be carrying this thurible, and up here I'll put the incense in, and then I would have incense on the altar, and I'll do it quickly, we'd go around, and then we pause, and then we always offer praise to Jesus crucified. So we raise it up and incense to the altar, and then we go around the rest of the way. And then again later, when we have the bread and wine on the altar uh, to be consecrated, and then we incense those as well. We do it again, and it's a lot of smoke, but it's the idea is that we're offering up to God the offering of ourselves. And then if we're having a funeral at the end, uh, the body and the cask would be here, and then we commend, we offer that person back to God who gave that person to us in the first place, and then we put incense, we do incense all around, uh, all around the casket, and then again, since Jesus is in front of us, we incense uh, uh, Jesus on the cross, and so on. And so that's uh, how we use the thurible. We also use it uh, when we have Eucharistic adoration, which we'll talk about on another day when we take the body of Christ, a host from the tabernacle that you just heard about from Deacon Bob, and we put it in a large, um, what we call it a monstrance. A monstrance means to show. It's a place to show and uh, be able to see the body of Christ. And so with Jesus exposed on the altar, just so we can give reverence to him and a chance to pray in his presence. And so at the beginning and the end of what we call benediction, uh, exposition, we incense uh, the monstrance, Jesus in the monstrance, and then the end benediction means a blessing. We give a special blessing. Let's see if I left anything out over here. 
Great. Well, good. So our tour will continue. One other important thing in the Mass is the vestments that the priest wears. And the deacon also wears vestments, and those of you who are altar servers also wear a vestment. So all of us uh, who persist, participate as a minister in the Eucharist, in the Holy Mass, wear an alb. And an alb is just a tunic. It was the basic uh, clothing that anyone uh, in Jesus' time would have worn. And when we see pictures of Jesus, he's always wearing some kind of a long tunic. And if you ever visit any of the countries in the Middle East, particularly in the desert, you'll see that the people still wear them, uh, the men especially, uh, because even though they look very heavy, they're, uh, they're actually fairly cool to wear. Um, uh, so this goes on. That's the first thing that we put over our regular clothing. And then the second thing, oh, then I, I'm missing it, but we wrap around the middle, we put what's called the cincture. And it, it's exactly the, uh, um, it serves as a belt. That's what the, mean, the, the word cincture actually means. It just means belt. Uh, so it, it just holds the thing, things together. Uh, but it also is a symbol of chastity and offering ourselves uh, to the Lord. And then the next thing that goes on uh, that the priest will wear is what's called a stole. And you may notice the deacon also wears a stole. When the deacon wears a stole, he wears it this way. It goes across his chest like this. And you may wonder about that. It's like, hmm, I've seen this before. Well, where you've seen it, if you've ever been a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, or if you've seen a Miss America pageant, or if you've seen the president of almost any country or many countries in the world, or sometimes royalty, it's a symbol of the office that someone holds. So like in the Scouts, as you get merit badges, or you move up in the Scouts, you wear a different kind of, uh, of sash that shows your badges and so on. Uh, but when the deacon wears the stole as he does this way, it's a symbol of his office, his authority as a deacon. And so, it, so it's a symbol. And then, but when the priest wears the stole, he wears it this way. Uh, the two pieces hang in the front. And then distinguishes it says, oh, his role then is a priest. But again, it's a, a symbol of the office that he holds and reminds us that besides just being a guy, and like I am, I'm just any guy, when uh, because of my ordination and when I celebrate the Eucharist, I stand in the person of Christ. And <clears throat> these are th symbols, <coughs> excuse me, symbols of that authority. And then <clears throat> on top, the last thing we put on is um, a chasuble. The priest will wear a chasuble and a, a deacon will wear a dalmatic. Not always, but sometimes he'll wear a dalmatic. And the dalmatic, it looks just like this, but if you look up close, it actually has sleeves in it. Um, that's, you can tell the difference between his and ours and the priest, between a deacon and a priest. And the one the priest wears just has a hole in it. It's more like a poncho. And uh, that's the one the priest wears, so it's called the chasuble. And it, essentially, its role, it comes from the way, from the ancient world. You, you had, you'd wear your tunic, but when it was cold, you would wear uh, your chasuble or your um, poncho, for lack of a better word, and it had exactly the function you'd expect to keep you warm. But also, in the ancient world, they were very carefully decorated, decorated very beautifully, uh, and so people of, um, you know, who were maybe uh, senators or government people or people of wealth, they would have fancier chasubles and fancier clothes. But for us, again, it's the symbol of the office we hold, the dalmatic for the deacon and the chasuble for the priest. And as you've seen at some of the ceremonies we have, like at Easter and so on, the ones we have are a little fancier, or maybe a little more colorful, or maybe have some more fancy embroidery. So that's what the priest wears. Why and, is it that color? Sorry? Why is it that color? Oh, yes. Why is it this color? Now, I know we had a previous family-based session, and I know we talked about the colors, but the stoles and the dalmatics, and also the altar cloth, you can't see it too well here. Um, right now, these are green. The ones I'm holding up are green. And we wear green in ordinary time. And we also talked about the seasons. I know you remember. So in ordinary time, the color is green. And uh, we have two periods of ordinary time, as you know. We're in the first period of it now. And then that period will get interrupted by Lent. And during Lent, we'll wear purple or violet. And that uh, color is a symbol of repentance, because in Lent, 
we're preparing our hearts for the sacrifice of Jesus in Holy Week and then for the resurrection. Uh, following Lent, we have the season of Easter, and uh, the whole Easter Sunday and the whole Easter season, and on every special feast or uh, feasts of the saints and other celebratory feasts, and also at funerals when we celebrate the life of the person who's returning to the Lord. In all those seasons and times, we wear white. Sometimes you'll see gold, and like I said a minute ago, that sometimes vestments are decorated in a fancy way. So gold is just more a more dramatic version of the white vestment. So we have green for ordinary time, white for the Easter season and for the saints and so other solemnities. And then um, after the Easter season, we return to ordinary time to green. And um, we then, uh, what colors have I left there? One, two, three. I've got way of green. I've got white. I've got violet. So the last one doesn't actually have its own season, but the last color we'll see in our vestments is red. And red is a symbol of martyrdom because it's the color of blood. So whenever we celebrate a saint who has died uh, to, uh, because of the faith, uh, we will wear red. But also red, very importantly, uh, is the color that reminds us of the Holy Spirit because red is the color of fire and the color of flame. And so we know at the Pentecost, um, the Holy Spirit uh, came down upon the disciples and filled them with strength and courage. And we had the reading about Jesus' baptism just the other week. John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, and we heard that the, the sky was torn open and um, the, uh, the flame, um, one like a, a dove, came over Jesus. And then the Father said, You're my beloved Son. I am well pleased. And so the, the symbol of the Holy Spirit uh, is, is always the color red. So at confirmation and... Um, We'll, we'll, we'll always have red. And then on Good Friday, because we commemorate Jesus' death, we wear red. And the feasts of all the, um, uh, all the martyrs, we wear red. And I not think if there's any other day we wear red. Oh, Pentecost Sunday, of course, commemorating the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles and giving them the strength to proclaim Jesus to all. Hi, everyone. Deacon Paul here. I'm going to give you a little bit more of a tour of what's going on in the church. So right now, what you see in your screen is a picture of the flag. That's the Vatican flag. So we keep the Vatican flag and the American flag both in the church. So the Vatican flag uh, is for that, the Vatican, which is in Italy. Beyond the Vatican flag, and I hope you can see it, it's a little bright, that is a stained glass uh, depiction of St. Andrew. So St. Andrew is our patron saint here at St. Andrew's Parish. Um, he was one of the first followers of Jesus. And he's the one that brought, if you remember from the Gospel recently, he's the one that brought St. Peter to Jesus. So uh, we have many different stained glass uh, pictures throughout our church. In fact, what some people don't know is the stained glass at St. Andrew's is actually very well respected in the art community. Um, I know there's art history classes that have actually taken a look at our uh, stained glass windows. So next time you're at St. Andrew's, take a look. Opposite St. Andrew on the other side of the church, which you can't see right now, is St. Uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton. And St. Uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton was known for helping with formation of people. In fact, Seton Hall is therefore named after St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. So there's many stained glass windows, and I hope that you have a chance to take a look at those at some point. So come with me, I've got a few more things to show you. I want to take a quick moment and explain what I just did. What I just did is called genuflect. And I just learned from Father Joe, actually, um, genuflect in the Latin is bend the knee. So if you notice, I went down on my right knee, and you may not have seen me, but I did a sign of the cross. When people come into the church, they typically will do a genuflect before they come into their pew. Uh, however, you really should genuflect when you're passing the altar or you're passing the tabernacle. The altar, as I'm sure they talked about before, is a place where we show, at Mass, is the sacrifice of Christ. So it's very important that we reverence the altar. 
and the tabernacle is where we keep the body of Christ that we have after consecration. So it's very important to reverence those things, and we do so with a genuflect. Okay, so over in this side of the church, we've got a few things happening. First, I want to take note, right here, is the Stations of the Cross. This is not the first station. First station is out of the camera's reach on the other side of the church. But there are 14 Stations of the Cross. So what does that mean? Stations of the Cross um, is our walk, if you will, through the last three hours of Jesus' life prior to crucifixion. It's a time where we take into account all he endured for us and that suffering just prior to, just prior to and including his crucifixion. So um, there's 14 stations, and they go all the way around the church. Um, I think right now I'm at number eight. Um, ours aren't numbered. If you go to some churches, you'll see a little number next to them. But there are 14 stations of the cross, and typically people will do the stations of the cross on Fridays during Lent. Um, some people choose to do Stations of the Cross every Friday on their own, but most parishes, and ours included, will have a formal Stations of the Cross each Friday during Lent. Let's see what happens with pandemic, how our Stations of the Cross work out, but uh, hopefully once this is all over, we'll be doing Stations more normally. Big statue here on the wall right above me is St. Mary. So we have St. Mary, and then on the opposite side of the church, we have St. Joseph, Jesus' parents. So many people will come, and when they come to pray, they keep St. Mary in mind, or they keep St. Joseph in mind. Uh, as Mrs. Rome reminded me before I started, Saint, this is the year of St. Joseph. Uh, Pope Francis has announced that. So keeping the parents of Jesus in, in mind, uh, keeping them in mind is important because while Jesus is God on earth, they were his human parents, and they helped raise him, and they helped love him, and they helped protect him in his most vulnerable years. And it's very important to, to show that respect. Sometimes people will pray by the statue of the Blessed Mother. Sometimes they may be kneeling. Sometimes they may genuflect. People have different ways to reverence um, uh, St. Mary. But I just want to let you know that that is what this statue is. Also over here, we have the votive candles. Um, now, some people may go, well, what does that mean? So the votive candles are an opportunity for people to pray and think and consider a loved one. So sometimes after Mass, what people will do is they'll come over and they'll put a little coin in the slot and they'll press a button, and that is to remember that person who might have passed, might be someone who's sick who just needs prayers, or it could just be someone remembering and longing for someone. So this is an opportunity for them to have that remembrance and for other people to see it. So right now we have five candles lit, and that means to me that there's five of our parishioners looking for prayers for their five loved ones. So even though I don't know who those five are, I'll take a minute and I'll say a prayer for them. I'll say a prayer for the people that they're praying for but also say a prayer for the parishioners, because obviously that's something very important to them. So if you see the votive candles and you see them lit, say a little prayer for our, our fellow parishioners who might be needing some help. But in addition, if you've got someone that you're thinking of, feel free to come and, and do a votive candle. Also over here, um, we have the holy water tank. So now, because of pandemic, it's empty right now. But typically, this is filled with holy water, and there's a little spigot at the bottom. I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up. It's kind of far away. But there's a spigot at the bottom, and you can fill a container of holy water. And some people like to have holy water to go home with. Um, they may use it to, you know, for a loved one to make them feel better. There's lots of reasons why people may take holy water home. So you really kind of can't take a container and stick it in one, of the, uh, in one of the little containers where we dip and we bless ourselves, and we don't really want people dipping containers into the baptismal font, so this holy water tank gives people that opportunity to take the holy water home.
One thing we didn't really talk about a lot today was the music aspect of our liturgies. And where I'm standing is actually called a cantor stand. And if you look over here, you'll see that we right now we have a piano. We're very excited. We're going to be getting a new piano as well. But our liturgy is only enriched by the songs, and the songs always tie into our reading. So we did talk a lot about it, but it's certainly an important part of our liturgy. So hopefully, today you learned a little bit more about our church, when you come and when we can all be together again. Take some time to look around. See if you can find all the things we talked about. We talked about the altar. We talked about the ambo, the beautiful stations of the cross and the stained glass windows. Maybe some of you were even baptized at that baptismal font. But these are the beauty, beautiful things here at our parish, and we'd like for you to take some time to discover them yourselves. So hopefully you enjoyed our tour today and you learned a little bit more. God bless you, and thank you for being with us.